Hi there, me, your friendly neighborhood humble stroke assault. So we're going to discuss driving after a stroke. So this is, again, going to be a little bit of a research video, not so much of a research video, but I will leave some links down below in regards to some generally accepted guidelines about getting behind the wheel of some form of motorized conveyance and then getting onto the roadway. So let's just discuss my story. So I had a stroke. Didn't own a car at the time. So when I had my stroke, the doctor said, we're going to take your driver's license. A friend of mine was actually in Emerge and said, well, he doesn't own a car. So the doctor then decided they're not going to take my license because I'd have to convince someone to let me get behind the wheel. So I lucked out. Because generally after a stroke, they might take your license. So... Fast forward from June 21st to like August 4th or August 6th, something like that. Saw the neurologist again at the stroke outpatient clinic. He basically said he has no concerns about taking my license because I still don't own a car. And I'd still have to convince someone to give me a car. Now, in that interim, I'd been out night driving uh, one night and... It was it actually night at in darkness, so it was like 10, 10 o'clock, 10.30 at night. So it was fully dark. Um, there are some fairly rural or non-urban roads in the around the city I live in. So we ended up on one of these roads, and just I just couldn't handle it. I just all the bright lights, the darkness, the high amount of contrast. I had to basically close my eyes, duck my head, and ask to be taken home. Didn't like it, but it happened. Um, I think I drove once or twice after that, but very small amounts, like very, one, I know one night my girlfriend and I were visiting friends in another city, and it's about 45 minutes away, predominantly highway driving, um, I drove home. Didn't have any problems. I knew the route, I knew the highway, so... It was pretty much me knowing how to get to that place. Now, after my stroke, when my parents came up, they asked me for directions one day to get to, I forget where, a restaurant. But I, I literally looked and like, I have no idea how to get there. I know where it is, but I don't know how to get there. I, I legitimately don't know. Then in November, I think November, uh, my girlfriend... I went with her to work because I was going to then take her car to the mechanic. So I only had to drive her car back. Should have been like a 30 minute drive. Should have been. Um, I had to call her for help because I got confused. I got a little bit lost. Not as lost as I thought I was, but I started to get confused and I needed help. And once I figured out where I was, because it almost came down to the point where I was going to walk away from the car and dial 911 for help. It almost came to that, but I calmed down, I got a hold of her, um, I, drew, I got the car to the mechanic, and I then took a cab home and then went right to bed. That was latter November, early December. Haven't really driven a lot since then, maybe here and there once or twice, but not a lot. So, I've already had a couple tests. Now, I was just on vacation, as you all fine folks know. And while on vacation, I got to drive for about three and a half hours, all highway driving, um, in between Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. I think most of the driving is actually in New Brunswick, but here, I don't know. So, I, after three, three and a half hours, I knew that was my tipping point. And I've learned... Through a couple stumbles and trials, um, and my girlfriend being reasonable and correct, yeah, she was right. I know I said it. My girlfriend was right. Um, not to be stubborn, check my pride at the door, and just call my own foul. Like, I'm done. So about the two and a half, two and three quarter hour mark, I, I knew I was getting to the point where I was getting mentally fatigued and me being 
a safe driver was no longer an option. So we'd already agreed that I'd drive for maybe three, possibly four hours. And at the point where she felt uncomfortable or I felt uncomfortable, we'd call it and just change around. Well, it got to the point where I just knew I was mentally done and I had to stop. So we had to get gasoline anyways and we stopped, got gas, got a bevy and changed around. So I know I can drive after my stroke. I know I'm good on the highway. I know in town I'm fairly decent. For me to go to Toronto, I could probably handle certain parts of Toronto. Like downtown, forget about it. 401, probably not. Um, the 404, the Don Valley Parkway, all of that funness, probably not. But if you're in certain sort of neighborhoodish type places um, that aren't that busy, I could probably handle that. So let's just talk about the realities of driving after stroke. So, one, in Canada, we have this chargeable offense under the Criminal Code of Canada called impaired driving. That's not drive over 80. So that's not you have more than 80 milligrams of alcohol in your blood. That's impaired. Now, impaired is the catch-all. Anything that you have done that impairs your ability to drive, that includes not enough sleep. That includes too much cough and cold medic medicine. That includes any other medication you might take that might impair your ability to drive. So if you're a medical marijuana user and you take the medical marijuana, and I mean THC, not CBD, and you are imbibing in too much to the point of having positive and safe control of a motor vehicle, well, you're going to jail. It doesn't matter you have a license. It doesn't matter you've seen a doctor. It doesn't matter you have a prescription. If you use any medication to the point whereby you do not have reasonable faculties to properly, safely operate and control a motor vehicle, that's impaired driving. Having a neurological injury and attempting to drive, that's impaired driving. Now, you can start to debate the finer points of, I'm an Article 4 free inhabitant, I'm a free man, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a flesh and blood human being, I don't need a license to drive and all that sovereign citizen bullshittery doesn't count. Even if you're a sovereign citizen driving a vehicle or a vessel or a mode of conveyance, even for non-commercial or commercial means, without being in complete control of your faculties is now a criminal offense. It's not a Highway Traffic Act offense. It's a criminal offense. You are going to go to jail. And they're going to take your car. So, let's just talk about who can take your license. Now, I'm going to use my example because I only know my example. So, I'm going to implore you, please, go to your nearest province, state, or territorial licensing agency and determine with them if you are legal to drive. And if you are not legal to drive, how do you get that license back? go to the Ministry of Transport, the Department of Motor Vehicles, the Highway Licensing Department, whatever you call it, I don't know, and I, I really don't need to know. Whatever you happen to call it in your area, you need to approach them and go, someone took my license, here's why they took it, what do I need to do to get it back? And be prepared for the answer, you can't. Now, if they say you can't, that is a, unfortunately, medical decision. So, if the emergency room doctor didn't take your driver's license, the neurologist from ICU or the stroke unit can take your driver's license. If the neurologist from the ICU or the stroke unit didn't take your driver's license, the cardiologist that may or may not get involved can take your driver's license. If the cardiologist didn't take your driver's license, then your general practitioner can take your driver's license, meaning your family doctor. If your family doctor didn't take your driver's license, then your physiotherapist has the ability to take your driver's license. And if your physiotherapist didn't take your driver's license, then your occupational therapist has the ability to take your driver's license. Just as your eye doctor has the ability to take your driver's license, at least in the province of Ontario. So they didn't take my driver's license. So when I got to physio, 
they said, do you have a driver's license? And I went, yep, I do. And they looked at me like, I beg your pardon? You have a, I have the mythical driver's license. And they looked at me like, how in the fuck do you still have that? And I went, fun fact, let me tell you why. So I did. And they looked at me like, you realize you literally just won the stroke lottery. And I'm like, oh, there's a lottery with a stroke? Ooh, didn't know that. Shitty lottery to get entered into, but I guess I won. So about two and a half months into the physio, the occupational therapy routines, my physiotherapist sat me down and she said, I have to tell you something. I'm like, okay, Nancy, what is that? And she proceeded to tell me she has to give me a test. And if I fail the test, she's going to take my driver's license. So she made me do some things and I passed the test. She then turned me over to my occupational therapist. My occupational therapist said, okay, I got to tell you some things. And I went, okay, Carrie, what's that? And Carrie said, I'm going to give you a test. And if you fail the test, I'm going to take your driver's license. Hmm. I passed the test. Then Carrie said, it's up to either your eye doctor, because that was relatively the next uh, doctor's appointment I was going to have, or it's up to your family doctor. And if neither of those decide to take your license, Right now, no one is taking your license. Hmm. Then they told me, just wait in the mail for the license renewal application to show up. So, I waited for the license renewal application to show up. And magically, it did. Then I went down to the Ministry of Transport. And then I filled out all the paperwork. And it was effortless. Right? So... I realize that my example is not going to be the average. I realize that my example might be drastically different than yours. And I, I, I appreciate how hobbling, how isolating, how restrictive someone taking your license from you will be. Especially because if you've had a heart attack or you've had a stroke, they're going to make you jump through extra hoops. Um, I was told that depending on the results I performed on the test, I may be referred to an after-stroke specialized rehab team for driving. Um, I realize you may have to pay for driver's lessons again. You know, I, I realize there's so many things that just to get your license back, you're going to have to prove to a whoever took your license, you can pass that test again. And then they're going to sign off saying, yes, they're now suitable in my eyes to get your license back. But now you're going to have to go to the government um, and do whatever the government wants, be that province of Ontario or the state of Maryland or New South Wales, or whatever. I just depends where you live. So, if you've had your license taken away, and let's, let me say this one thing. Just consider if you get easily confused. Just consider if you get easily fatigued. Just consider lights and sounds can impact you. And that's in a supermarket. Now put yourself behind a 2,000 pound weapon called a car, right? You run into someone with your shopping cart. Oh, I'm sorry. Is everything okay? Yeah. Let me get you a new box of ice cream without licking it first, right? Now consider that with a car. You're going to jail, right? The cop's going to show up. You're going to be stuttery. You're going to be panicked. You're probably not going to walk so right. Right? So, I know right after my stroke, I had difficulty in, in supermarkets. Just even considering me getting behind the wheel of a vehicle, unsupervised, unattended, was just not going to happen. So, if you've been restricted from driving... And by restricted, I mean your license has been taken away. E even in the short term, like your doctor has said, I'm going to take this away from you, but I'm going to see you in eight weeks and then we're going to revisit this, right? 
or it's been, you know what? I don't believe you're safe to drive. You've, you haven't been successful on the testing I've performed. And remember, the testing you're doing is based on a predetermined scale. It's not an arbitrary thing. There's a, there's a rubric or a matrix that you have to meet. So once you've been given the okay to drive, you may need to consider, and I've seen these online and I don't know where to get them and I don't know if they even have any legal weight. You may need to get something that identifies you as someone who may have deficits that might provoke someone to think you're drunk, right? So let's just consider it. If you have aphasia or verbal apraxia or um, anomia, like any of those communication deficits, to someone who's untrained, it could look like you're drunk. It could look like you're trying to talk when you're drunk. If you have foot drop or some other mobility issue, it could look like you're drunk, right? So you may need to get some documentation, and I don't know how you would achieve this. So you might need to reach out to your local stroke association, your local brain injury association, uh, the March of Dimes, whoever. Um, your, your general practitioner, your neurologist, I don't know. You may need to reach out to someone to get some form of documentation for you to keep on your person when you're driving to say, hey, I'm not shit-faced. I have a brain that tried to kill me. That, that might be a necessity. So please, I implore everyone, I realize how much you want your independence back. I appreciate how driving is pretty much the ultimate form of independence. If, you, if you're not safe to drive, don't. If you've had your license either suspend them, suspended while well under investigation by your doctors, or you've had it rescinded because of your medical conditions, like they've actually taken it away from you, please don't. And don't try to bullshit yourself or the people around you with your level of inability. Like, don't, yeah, I'm, I'm good to drive, I know what I'm doing. Yeah, so how are you going to feel if you claim that you're good to drive when you know you're not? And then something happens that you can't undo. Something happens that you can't take back. Something happens that is the ultimate worst case scenario, but you get to live. Like, how, how, are, you, how are you gonna feel about so please act responsibly, drive responsibly. That's all I'm going to say. So on that note, if you happen to be enjoying my content uh, over the last two months, in, or almost, sorry, two months, duh, um, one year and a bit, please like, share, subscribe. If you know someone that's going through a post-stroke journey or supporting someone going through a post-stroke journey, please point the channel out to them. They might get some value out of the content. If you happen to see either in yourself or someone around you the signs and symptoms of a stroke, Excuse me. That being someone immediately appears to be befuddled, confused, or has lost their sense of balance. Someone who has vision problems. They see in grayscale. They can't see it in one eye. They can't move their eyes in a certain direction. And they only see in a little dot of the world. You, someone who has facial droop. There's an immediate noticeable slackening of the facial muscles. Someone who can't raise both arms equally effectively or at all. Someone who can't smile equally effectively or at all. Someone has slurred, stuttering speech, inappropriate word usage for situation or context. Someone has general body weakness or weakness on one side. Or someone has the inability to stand unaided. Please immediately place that person in a position of comfort and dial 911. Something so simple can save a life.